Um, I am Ventura Morton, and I want you to uh, meet Dr. Stan Stokely. Um, we've been charged with the task of giving you some ideas and, and really facilitating a conversation about how do we really build community in an online line environment. So I'm going to start off. Um, we do have an agenda in front of you. We'll talk about these few things. Uh, we probably won't make the entire 15 minutes for each one, but we, because we want to spend some time um, developing tools that we can take home with us. I mean, it's nothing like going to a professional development or going to a meeting and feeling like you wasted your time. So we don't want to do that. We want to maximize the time. That's actually one of the clues for how we're building a community is to maximize all of our time when we have opportunities to communicate with the folks around us. Uh, one thing I'll ask you to do is to um, build trust. Let's um, unhide our videos if that's possible. So we can have a chance to see each other. Um, we'll have a chance to do that even more when we engage in, in more conversation later on. Um, you will keep your microphones muted for this time. Um, you can, um, if you need to raise a hand or ask a question or something, um, if you look on your participants list, make sure that's there. Uh, we're good, but if you have a question or whatnot, need to chime in, just let it know. You can type it into the text into the chat room and we'll be able to get those get those questions answered and things that are that are there so let's go have some fun um, let's talk first about how do we build community and most of us are campus leaders or training to be campus leaders because i've invited some of the folks from our classroom as well and all across the region um, we do want to say thank you to dr hulan and our um, CEREC system for hosting this for us and facilitating facilitating this for us digitally and calling us and saying hey let's do this and make it happen for us as a group so let's talk about how to build trust um, and what makes a community as a whole. We all know that communities are meaningful things and we want to talk about how we build them and what we do in each of them. So as I think about what goes on in the community and what makes it meaningful for us, um, one of the things we talk about is, is, is trust as a whole. And when I think about trust, it's basically doing what it is that you say you're going to do, being true to who you are, um, but also, and we talk about things from linked from a book that we're reading called Leverage Leadership 2.0. <clears throat> and Dr. Hulan and I are actually doing a course on this now um, through the PLU system, through the, uh, through the state system. But it's called Leverage Leadership and it's a meaningful text. And so some of these ideas are coming from there and we've mixed them and been able to grow those ideas as we go forward. But the one we talk about here with trust is setting a clear vision. And some of the things that you've done for the last few months, last eight, nine months at your school is you've been able to set a vision, um, a specific vision for your students and what you want to see them doing. You've been able to set a vision for what you expect to see your staff doing in the community. Um, you've also set a vision for what you want to see your faculty and for your community. And as you're looking at those visions, that's what we've been doing so far to build the community around us. Um, the other thing we talk about in this area is how are we being authentic to that specific vision? So we look at authentic, authentic authenticity. How are we being authentic to that vision? How are we being who we are in the things that we've asked our staff, our community, our students, and such to do for uh, do in the areas? Um, this does not mean, this means that you're being authentic and you have been authentic through what you've done um, throughout the last eight, eight months. So as we're branching out, and we'll talk a little bit later about what we do in this thing digitally, as we branch out, that doesn't mean that you can't do new things. What it means is that you're doing new things but you're still being true to who you are and true to who the vision is or the vision that you've laid out for your, for your campuses so far. Another part about making community is being intentional. And being intentional in this context means to make clear the plans that are directly linked to the vision. So making sure that I'm intentionally choosing these specific um, goals that we can make, we can meet. We're intentional about how we make these goals meaningful for us. We're, we're being, um, we're planning out things that are very well linked to our vision. So we're not missing, we're not missing gaps. And those are ways that we build trust and authenticity by being intentional about what's going on. And what you'll find as we're doing about building community here is that each of these things builds on the thing before it. So trust is built by being authentic. Authenticity is built by being intentional. And one of the key things that we often forget about is how are we going to make equity of opportunity for all of our students. And this is really a meaningful piece, and I think why quite a few of you have joined in today is to find out how we're gonna make these things equitable for all of our students as they go into this process. 
So let's look at what we talk about in equity and opportunity. This means that all involved have multiple opportunities to experience success. That means your parents have opportunities to experience success. That means your students have opportunities to experience success. That means your community has opportunities to experience success or participate in the success of the group. That means that your students have opportunities to experience success, even when they're not on campus for us. Um, and we do that by being intentional. And we do that by finding research-based strategies to provide and guide the materials that we use, research-based strategies that provide the strategies that we use, uh, research-based strategies, uh, research-based things that help us guide everything that we do. And part of that research is what we're going to be doing today is discussing what's going on around and what are we doing, what works for us. Um, as we go to the next slide, <clears throat> we talk a little bit about how do we build community in a, in a public realm? How do we build community? Um, how do we, so we've talked about what community is. Let's talk about how do we build community. And these are some of the things we want to talk about um, because they are meaningful for what we need to do as a whole um, and looking forward, because this will blend what we do on our, on our place-based campuses, what we do on our digital place campuses. So I'm going to pull from the supervision and instructional leadership text. Make sure I'm looking at the right screen on my screen. So you guys can see this on the screen. So the supervision and instructional leadership text, this is the 10th edition. And I post these up. These are all listed in the um, reference section at the end of the slide. So you can look down there as well and see those. <clears throat> but they talk about in the text here how to build community. So I want to make sure we have some clear things to thinking about what we need to be doing as a whole. Um, so we talk about leadership and building a community. Um, what we're thinking about is how we're being authentic communities, because in our traditional or our classic um, leadership uh, communities, they don't offer as many opportunities for us to branch out and to use what we call transformational leadership or to use a democratic um, basis for our leadership. Now, democratic doesn't mean that we have um, um, majority rules, but it means that everybody has an opportunity to sit at the table and they're invited to sit at the table. So in our democracy of, of, of community, we're inviting people that we look around. So quite frequently when I teach courses around, I'll ask who's excluded from this conversation? Who's not invited to this conversation? And those are the folks, those are the, the roles that we go out and invite back to the conversation because we want to be able to give everybody an opportunity to participate in this conversation. Um, in that, we're looking at mutual influence. Um, we try and find ways to make, to make uh, get a consensus in the group. And we try to find ways to help everyone have a personal agency in the group that we're not there just because we don't have this place, but we want to value the feedback that you're able to get and receive from this group. Um, let's talk a little bit about motivation. When we think about motivation, um, our motivations for our community and how we're building a community, this is key when we talk about what we're doing now. The motivation for every communication that you send out to your faculty, your staff, and your community should be about the vision that we talked about in the last slide. So our motivation is genuine in that process. It's based off of moral principles, what's going on in our community, how meaningful is this communication going to be for our community. Um, we work on shared beliefs, shared values, because you've already established values in the last eight weeks, last eight months of school. Let's continue those same values now. We just have to tweak them to make sure they can meet the needs of those students when we're not able to see them tangibly, tangibly or be with them every part of the day. Um, Let's see. Um, so we talk about relationships here as well. And in our relationships, we're looking at um, having a sense of belonging. How do we get people to belong in this environment? Um, and I think as we talked about the previous slide, when we talked about being true to ourselves, being authentic, meaningful communication, we didn't talk about that yet, but we can talk about that now, making sure that all of our communications are meaningful and that they are not wasting other people's time, I think is an important part of making a community um, keeping the community and the relationships growing in our area. Um, and then we have to set our priorities. This is a challenge for us. Um, I know that our state governor said at one point that this period of time that we're in school, we will not be um, you know, doing homework or, or grading assignments, but we also want to make sure that our students get the opportunity to engage in meaningful activities that are going to keep them engaged in our learning. And so we have to make sure we're doing that for, on a continuous basis. Um, we have to make sure we keep a commitment to the common good. Um, I'm in my, in my professional life, um, I was a part of the American, I am a part of the um, AERA, American Educational Research Association. We had a conference scheduled in San Francisco 
um, in April. And it was canceled back in March. March 5th, they decided, no, we're not going to have a place-based camp conference, but we will have a, um, we will provide a, an opportunity for us to have a digital conference. Well, last night we got an email that said, you know what, based on what's going on in our society, what's going on in our community, we have to make a decision that we're not going to even do the, the digital portion of this, this conference because it harms the commitment to our common goal. And if our common goal and our common good are not being benefited from this thing, then why are we making that decision for our group? And those are just some of the things that we can think about as we go through um, how do we address and how do we grow with our priorities. One of the other things we talk about there is unity with diversity. How are we meeting the diverse populations and the diverse needs of our students, of our faculty, of our staff, and the other folks around. So that's the kind of technical portions, the, the formal portions of our, of, our, of our presentation today. So you have some research-based things we talk to, to carry as you move forward. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Stan Stokely, and as we transition to some more of the interactive portion of our presentation today and of our session today, where we can have some time to talk, this is where we begin to show our cameras off, show off ourselves, and at the appropriate time, I'll have you to take the mutes off your microphones to have conversations, but we won't do that part just yet. So Dr. Stokely is going to talk to us a little bit and transition us and give us a, a, a way to think about uh, what we're doing. Dr. Stokely? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to join you all today and um, first of all I just want you to know I'm here as a learner I'm, I'm looking for ideas and suggestions so I'm really anxious to get into the conversation and hear what you're doing I certainly not presented as an expert on the subject but as I was talking to Dr. Elon and Dr. Morton uh, yesterday I was just sharing with them my analogy about this is kind of reminds me of Apollo 13 if you've seen the movie and the three astronauts are kind of trapped in space and things have gone bad and they're losing oxygen and uh, they need a filter. But the problem is they have a round hole and they got a square filter. And so if you remember, uh, all the engineers back in Houston came and dumped everything out on the table. If, if the, you know, if the astronauts had been in Houston, it would have been a real easy problem to fix, but they were out of space. They couldn't get their hands on them. And that's kind of the way we are right now. We don't have the kids here. Uh, I'm sitting in Sarah Land Elementary School all by myself in the conference room. I'm just drinking a beer up here. Uh, just so you know, it's A&W and, and root beer. Um, and uh, so we can't get our hands on the kids. So I think what our job is, is, is to dump on the table everything that we have and try to figure out how to make it work the very best that we can. So, uh, you know, it's a challenge. Uh, it's, it's an awkward period of time for me as a principal because in, in, in so many ways, I can't figure out what to do. I feel like I need to be at school, at work, doing something. I get here, you know, I, I feel limited on what I can do. So, uh, so anyway, um, that's, that's just kind of where we are. My school's grades two through five with about 900 kids just give you an idea of the size of the school. Thank you, Dr. Stokely. And I think that's, that's a place that we want to really give point to. Part of us building community in the online place is for us to give voice to the diversity of access that we have to what's going on. As Dr. Stokely said, he has you know, this, this school with almost 900 students that are there, but he doesn't have access to all 900 of those students digitally. I mean, how many of those students have, um, and that's, that's good, Dr. Hulan, to the next slide would be good. Um, so let's think about that as a group. What that technology is available um, for us to be able to access the students that are in our area? And so this time we can, we can unmute our microphones when we're talking. When we're talking and then when we're not talking, we'll come and mute those back. Uh, we do have someone from CEREC office who's taking notes for us as well. So we'll be able to attach these notes and things that are said that are there. If you have a comment and you don't, uh, may not be comfortable with, with, with saying that out loud, we're going to give voice to that as well. You can type a comment into the chat box and so we can we can get that and bring that to voice as well so we can use all the resources that we have available here in zoom to be able to have some of this conversation so there's a couple of questions we have here about which technologies do we use that that are available um, to access the students that are around us um, so let's talk a little bit about that who has some who has some folks who'd like to answer some questions there about what technology are you using currently to connect with your teachers your students and i'm going to add there to your communities as well I'm sure the crickets have something too that you guys can participate. 
Yeah, I got to get unmuted and uh, and start the conversation here. But I'll just say very quickly, you know, obviously we're using Zoom with our faculty. It's really kind of funny because we don't have traditionally have faculty meetings every week. We usually meet once a month whenever we need to meet. But now that we're in this situation, we're meeting every Monday morning at 10 o'clock on Zoom. And I think that's just been really important just because we need to see each other. We need to hear each other. We don't just talk about what's going on academics. Everybody's sharing out what they're doing, what their challenges are, but just kind of gives everybody a chance to just kind of, just kind of share their feelings. And um, so, you know, that's, if you hadn't used Zoom very much, it's really, it's really easy. And uh, right now the 40 minute window has been lifted, I think for people in education. So that's been really great. So all the businesses that are struggling, Zoom's not one of them. And Zoom is not one of them. Um, we are, I'm part of the AMSTI program and we are using Zoom to work as a professional community. We're open online from 9 to 12 every day for teachers to come in and we're actually holding like one big Zoom room and a teacher can come to that site off of our website and then we can go into breakout rooms. So if you want to talk about math or you want to talk about science, you can be put into that Zoom room. Um, I know that Clark County has a new app that I'm very impressed with that their superintendent is sending out information through this app and I see a lot of teachers and students using um, social media, Facebook, things like that to connect. I think that's pretty cool. Wow. I see that. I think someone in our group has mentioned that they have an app they're using for announcements. Do you want to type that, the type the name of that app in if we could all access that or if it's something that just your district is using? And also Ashley Malone, who's on the um, chat with us, she shared they're using Zoom and Google Classroom as two tools to connect with teachers and students. Clark County so, is using a district app. I think Chelsea may have just mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, someone's in the chat window sharing that as well. I'll try to figure out the app that's being used and I'll share it. Thank you. So think about these things as we're looking at what technology is available um, and what technology resources would you like to share. And so we're sharing, this is an opportunity for us to share those times. But as you're thinking about your ideas of what you'd like to share, um, one of the reasons we're using these technology opportunities, what they can be used for in the digital world, um, it may not be that we're always going to give an assignment, but I know that there are times, uh, my daughter this morning came to a digital classroom they use um, um, Google Classroom, and there's not an assignment, but there's an opportunity for them to come and hang out, to kind of see each other, to get to know, because we want to manage the anxiety of our students. That's part of us being genuine to who we are. If we had a student that was crying in the hallway in our, in our place-based campuses, we would go to that student, we would, we would comp be compassionate with that student, and we would show empathy with that student. We need to be able to do that same type of thing as we are here in our digital space, being, meaning that we're spending time just having a chance to hang out. Um, once I realized that last week, I thought, oh, wait, I haven't communicated with my students. I mean, I have students in this time that haven't been communicated with since they got back from spring break. Oh, the second week of spring break, which may cause anxiety. And so I've set up an opportunity for them to sit down and just have a chance to chat, just an open conversation. Where we can talk about what's going on. That's the time for us to check in on what our emotions are like, what our feelings are like to get some of those misconceptions are out um, taken care of. But to really get a chance to think about what's going on with us and talk about that because we really don't get our opportunities to go and do a lot of good work. Um, as we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if I'm feeling unsafe, I'm not doing a lot of thinking. I'm not doing a lot of creating. I'm trying to make sure that my safety is taken care of. And so we need to take that opportunity, whichever way we can, um, to make sure we do that. I hear um, Ann is talking about Blackboard. Um, Ms. Archie's talking about Google Meet, um, Google Hangouts. Um, there's an open parents portal, again, for someone, for their employees. But have we talked about outdialers? Have you communicated with your students through outdialers for those who don't have access to technology? Giving them an opportunity to at least get a phone call from somebody at the school to say that, hey, we're still, we, we know that you're out there. We're still thinking about you. Pam? I was just about to say something. I, I uh, this is Pam Moore from University of South Alabama. I just spoke with a teacher and that was one of the things that she was sharing that she wanted to reach out just through a phone call to her students because her students are very young and they're not doing Zoom perhaps in kindergarten without some parental assistance. 
or even Google Meet in kindergarten or first grade without that. But just a phone call from her to know that she's still thinking about them and they're still part of their learning community, their class, their school. So that's one thing that beyond just the pure technology ones that we're thinking about, but also those are, and I like the word you just used, you know, those things that are low bar as far as the technology is concerned. How can you connect with them? Because you still have to have that community. And those are the things that I'm so impressed that you're talking about and writing down because that's the part that technology will sometimes isolate us. And we need to use the community aspects of the technology and not just technology. Correct. I think it's a very valid point that you bring up there, um, and Dr. Moore. The idea that technology can be a form to separate us. And especially in our environment, we have uh, rural schools out there. And I know quite a few of you, as I'm looking at the names and folks that are here, the folks that I recognize are from rural schools in the area. And it's not that your children aren't able to afford having Wi-Fi at their home. It's that they don't have the infrastructure in the city to provide the Wi-Fi at their homes. Um, personally, I'm experiencing that now. I live in the, in the county of Mobile. And I live far enough out in the county of Mobile, close to, um, close to Mississippi. And there's no internet provider available. So when you say high-speed internet, that's six megabars per second. Six. When that means you can have one, possibly two devices on at one time. No video streaming. Um, so when we have opportunities, we have the luxury to be able to come to another place that's still in a quarantine type place, um, that's still a sterile environment, but we have higher internet, in, uh, but we have to move closer to the city. But our students don't have that. Um, one of the things that I, I, when I started thinking about this activity, thinking about technology and how do we engage in technology, I asked one of my, one of my colleagues, a close friend of mine, uh, Monty, Dr. Monty Lombarger, who's the principal in Tuscaloosa City Schools, He's been there since 2016. I asked him, what do you do to kind of keep your folks in task? And what do you do um, to keep them engaged? How do you keep your folks that are there? And one of the things he talked about, he says, my entire staff is expected to contact families once a day and then check on them to assist with academics. So how are we calling? I mean, we're all at work. How are we giving opportunities for our students, for our faculty, for our staff to call and say, hey, student, I know you're struggling with whatever it is that's going on. How are things going? But having that conversation set up already. How are things going on our campus? I think I saw doc, uh, Dr. Lombard pop, it, pop in. So if you want to say anything, Dr. Lombard, you're welcome to do so. Um, Dr. Morton. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. This, doc, this is Stephanie Hulon. Uh, Miss Archie had something on the chat window that I wanted to share. She said, my child's kindergarten teacher is using the Class Dojo app and Seesaw to send video messages and read AR books to students. And I thought this was a powerful thought, but keeping that relationship going is very important to the student's emotional state during all of this. I think that's an important piece, um, as we talked about earlier, about being authentic to who we are. So we use what Class Dojo, we have things like, um, um, what is this, Edmodo. We, I'm looking at my phone to pull up the things that we have in here. We have Family Seesaw, we see Blooms, we see Remind. Continue to use these devices to reach out to our students. They may not have access, especially in our elementary, they may not have their own personal phone at home, but they may have that, that a parent can say, hey, I've got a, re a response from Remind from your teacher. And it lets the child know that the teacher is actually engaged and still wanting to communicate. It's nothing like being sent off to go home and now I'm anxious because I don't know how my teachers are doing. I don't know how my family at home that I've been spending the last eight and a half months with, they're now alienated from me. It's almost like a, a, a bad divorce. But we don't want that to be a divorce. We want it to be an ongoing relationship that just changes the dynamics of how the relationship works. All right. Any other things we want to talk about about technology and how technology, how we can use or which technologies we can use to make this thing work for us? All right, again, you can interact. This is an interactive place. I have not been a great lecturer, but I can definitely do some interaction there. Um, uh, we have a person from Clark County I'd be interested in learning more about the ALP. And my question would be, is this something that you'll already had in motion or is this something that you developed uh, just for this particular situation? Do we have a Clark County per person here? We, 
We do, I think. She's typing in the chat. She may not have access to audio, so I'll read what she's saying. Okay. Um, a Facebook class page, closed groups for parents and students. Yes, they already had the app in place. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I see somebody mentioning the article. There is an interesting article that just came out on AL.com about status of Alabama schools. It has some kind of question and answer kinds of things. If you haven't seen that, you might want to take a look at it when we're done. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for sharing that with us. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to hear that this, these things that are already in place um, in Clark County are being used over the last two weeks regularly. Um, and I think that's the key piece that we're looking at is how do we find ways? And so as we're talking about technology, uh, we'll go ahead to the next slide which talks about communicate authentically. And as we talk about communicating authentically, these are the things that we're talking about now. What are we doing that we've already been doing? How are we being genuine to who we are? And what are we adding to this process in the, in, the, in the way of thinking about what can we do to make this process even better for us? <clears throat> um, so let's think about that. What are we doing to, we've talked about a great, great deal about how we're meeting with our students. What are we doing to meet with our parents? And we can't invite them to come to campus and offer food, that one's out. But what are some of the things that we can think of that you are doing to engage with your parents? What would you like to see happening as a parent? And I think that's a key place that we need to have when we talk about how do we include and who's included on the tape in the conversation. As a parent, how would you like to be engaged? So let's take off some of our principal hats and leader hats and all those things, put on that parent hat. What kinds of engagement do you want to see from your school? We have some parents out there. speak as a parent, but I will talk about some things that I've seen teachers doing for um, parents and not just students. I see a lot of teachers reading books online for students, but I'm starting to see where teachers are putting like PowerPoint presentations up for parents, kind of like a this is how you teach fractions and this is kind of what a word problem might look like. And I thought mm -hmm. that was pretty interesting. I think that is kind a good meaningful I think that's a meaningful way to have that conversation going. What are we doing to engage them? Um, I saw on, I think it was Facebook, there was a group in, in, in California who was looking at how do they engage with their folks. I don't know how they communicated it, but there was a caravan of teacher cars that went through a community and they honked or whatever it was to communicate that the students could see them and say, hey, you know, here's folks, they kept their social distancing away. I imagine, because I don't have access to, it, to find out for sure, but I imagine this was not something that was mandated by the campus leadership, but something that came as a grassroots effort to how can we meet the needs of our students? How can we engage our students? How can we deal with our students authentically? How can we be there for our students? And while we can't hug them or, or be that close with them, um, we can find ways to engage them in a meaningful way where we're actually seeing them along the way. It, it may be a teacher parade as I see in the chat group over here. Um, an opportunity for us to go down and just say it's there. But how do we communicate that to those students who don't have internet, who don't have um, Facebook, or who don't have the social media app platforms? Those are things we may have to send out through mail because we still can do mail outs. Those may be things that we have to do through an out dialer. Um, and then one of the things that we often forget about is we forget to do email. I mean, we've been communicating with parents via email through their phones, through their, through their smart devices, through whatever way we can for months now Let's not discredit that opportunity to reach out through email. And at least you can check and see if it bounces back. We know that doesn't work, but if they're going through, we have a better opportunity of, of connecting to, to parents and to students. Dr. Morton, um, you have some ideas shared in the chat window. Um, Wendy Singleton shared that they shared all of the class codes for Google Classroom to their parents at the beginning and then the parents are also emailing the teachers and having a conversation through email. Ashley Malone said they're using school status. Um, Ann said, we don't have one-to-one -one capabilities for students. We are using everything we can think of to communicate. Um, social media, the app she shared earlier. 
um, have been their go-to methods of communication through this. Uh, Chickasaw and um, Jackson thought about ideas of teacher parades. Chickasaw is having a teacher parade on Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, principals are sending group texts to their faculties to connect with them. Um, Miss Archie shared our teacher did a drive by today waving with a sign and she alerted us this morning through text. Um, and I saw that that was um, on Twitter, the Sarah Land Early Education Center. I saw their teachers did visits through the neighborhoods with signs. Um, so those are just some of the ideas that are being shared in the chat window. That's a good thing that those are good. Those are excellent ideas of how we can build that community. And the, the best part about this is there are very few wrong answers. The, the most wrong answer I think of when it comes to building a community is not to try. I mean, let's try and figure out what's out there. We would love to be able to reach every student in our school district, in our school zone, in our school place. Um, but that would be, that's our, that's our goal. And so our goal is to, to cover as many and using as many methods as we can along the way. But acknowledge that there may be some that we miss along the way. And so we can try to find other ways to meet those students later on other ways to meet those students. And we don't have to do this all today. I mean, we are scheduled in some districts to go back in the first or second week of April, some districts after that. But if this continues, um, where we're, we're required to be at home, then we can get, take this and do it a little bit longer as we go through. Um, I see Ann saying there's a lot of ground to cover. And yes, there is a lot of ground to cover. We don't have to do it all in one day. I think that's a key piece we need to be able to talk about, about how we be authentic in our ideas is that we don't have to do this all in one day. Dr. Morton, a question, yes. and I'm asking this after just having attended a town hall for school librarians from the American Association of School Librarians and about to enter another uh, workshop for teachers and, and how do you manage things during this time. A question for administrators or just something to think about and uh, Dr. Stokely, you kind of touched on this very briefly in the beginning. What are expectations for teachers? Uh, we talk about we're figuring out a lot of things as we do them, but I think that there are a lot of mixed messages of what am I as a teacher expected to do? Am I expected to do a drive-by? Am I expected to call my parents? Am I expected to post content? It missed mixed expectations, and I know it depends upon the school campus. I know it depends upon uh, preference and truly depends upon the student. But what are expectations that are being communicated about what should I do? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, you know, our challenge is that we've never been here before. We've never done this before. There's there's, there's nothing we can read about this. I, I think we're writing history as we go along here. You know, this will be in the world and American history moving forward. But, um, you know, it's been, in our district, it's very clear that we are not to promote something that's gonna bring people together. So, so first of all, it's just the safety for our families and for our communities. And that's a challenge because, you know, we're you know we're in the we're in the people business and we love to be with people so i think that that's a really the hard part for us um you know our challenge has been trying to figure out how much is too much because we've got some parents out there both parents are working some of our kids as young as nine years old are staying home keeping their younger brothers and sisters you know just finding bread and toilet paper is a challenge so you know, we don't want to overwhelm our parents. And so that, that's, been, that's been part of our challenge is we've almost had to tell our people, you know, careful not to over communicate here. You know, uh, if you feel some pushback from a family that they're frustrated, then, you know, maybe you need to rein back in a little bit on that communication. Uh, you know, some parents, they, they, they want all the communication that they can get and that's fine. But I, I, right now, we're just trying to find that happy medium balance. Um, we know we have a significant percentage of our kids who do not have devices or online access, um, uh, and or they're not doing it because we can. We have some programs where we can actually see what percentage of the kids are are getting online and doing programs and that type thing. So, so yeah, I, I think you had a great point. Is you know, I, I, I at this point. 
until we get further direction from the State Department of Education. And I think further direction will be coming. Um, right now, I'm assuming it's a district and a school basis on, on what the expectations are. But yeah, I think they're probably like me. They're just kind of awkward. They don't know what to do with themselves for part of the time, if that makes sense. I think that takes us to, to the next slide where we talk about, um, where are we? About championing routines. What kinds of routines that, are, that we can see for our teachers, for our staff, for our students, for our community, that we can be consistent with, with some of those routines. Um, Dr. Stokely, would you talk a little bit about the video that you were highlighted on, on AL.com the other day and some of the things you talk about there? Well, we, um... When we met as a faculty on the Sunday afternoon before this all went down on Monday, uh, we had gotten word that our school district was going to close on Monday. So we were from a scramble of time. So Sunday afternoon and Monday, we tried to put together worth of three weeks worth of instruction, some online and some in a paper packet for those who didn't have online access. But during that time, we also had a group of people that were just brainstorming on ideas. And one of the ideas was a uh, teacher had was for me to continue to do the morning announcements uh, via Facebook. And so I do kind of a try to do an exciting introduction to the morning announcements. So anyway, um, I've been just recording those. Our tech guys helping do some editing. And so we post up the morning announcements every morning and try to we do the pledge and the moment of silence and the idea behind it is to try to encourage our kids to watch the video and let that be the kickoff to their school day for whatever it is that they're doing. And so we challenge them in four areas. We challenge them to do something in academics. The ABC challenge is what we call it. Uh, a is for academics, B is for build the body, C is for clean the camp, and F is for family fun. So uh, we try to roll something out every day in those three areas just to try to encourage them just try something positive to um, to uh, get the kids uh, motivated to know that, it, hey, it is still a school day. <laughs> you know, at least in our mind it is. So I think it's important to be, um, to be intentional, again, back to the top about how we're building this, about which routines we think are, are um, which routines we think are meaningful here which routines we think will get the best benefit for our students, which routines will help them to um, stay in the routine, but also be genuine to what they've been doing before. Um, and if we need to create some routines, then which routines do we need to create in that process? Dr. Lombard? Hey, can you hear me, Dr. Morton? We sure can. Hey, good, good evening, everybody. How you guys doing? Hey, um, so, so I'm a principal at Central Elementary School, and I'm actually on two meetings at one time, but I, so I, I do apologize. So I was kind of, I was paying attention, but I wasn't paying attention all the way. So we're, we're talking about routines for children at home, is that correct? Yes, routines. Yeah, so, so one thing that I did is um, starting on Monday, I spoke to my teachers and I did a, um, like a, like a robo call to all our families. And I actually posted a schedule for my teachers and I posted a schedule for the parents. So I have something for them to do from eight o'clock all the way until three o'clock. So I, I'm asking the parents to get their boys and girls up as normal. I want them to get up, take a shower, put their clothes on, and I want them to um, say the champion creed. So that's like your mantra. So I want them to start their day off with with the champion creed just like they're going to school and see i look at it as you know school outside of the schoolhouse so so we're still having school and we have the same routines that we have in place at the schoolhouse so for example the students get up they take the shower they put their clothes on they have a, um, certain assignments one thing my district did is that we have two weeks of two weeks worth of packets so you can have packets or you can actually have online instruction so our boys and girls have two options and so like for example at eight o'clock we have a reading portion so the boys and girls they'll work on their computers with the reading portion at eight o'clock either online or with the packets and i've asked my teachers to do like what we call small groups in the elementary world 
So they can use Zoom to, to maybe like talk to three of their students while they're working on their packets or while they're working on their online instruction. So it's just like a regular school day. We have to stick with those same routines, those same practices, so our boys and girls will stay on track. Thank you for sharing those ideas. Um, those are meaningful ways of thinking about what we can do to really keep those routines going so that we don't get um, the apathy or we don't lose out. Now, again, we still have to think about how we're going to engage the students who are not accessing Zoom, who are not accessing um, other areas of, of technology along the way. So how do we can think about that? And that's something we need to really think about as a group. So this is an opportunity for us to share some of those ideas of what just just there's no spitball shoot out ideas about what we can do along the way to think about how are we going to engage those students who don't have the technology access. Sure. This is that time. <laughs> well, I do think that is a real challenge. Um, you know, we have the paper based option. We had a pick up day back when we could do that. But then since then, we've had to use the old fashioned mail system. If the parents get a message to us that they don't have a packet, then, you know, then we just mail it to them. But, you know, what about the parent who's not online and they're not getting us a message? I don't know. Those are the ones that we worry about. Um, I heard of one school district, and I don't remember where it was, but they have buses that were able to be Wi-Fi hubs or to broadcast a Wi-Fi signal. So they were able to take the school bus, park it in a neighborhood that they knew students were not able to have access to the internet and broadcast that. And those students already had devices that they'd been sent home from school or had devices, but they didn't have access to the internet. So they're able to log and do that opportunity and log on, have the students to be able to log on in that area. And that's something that we may be able to do or may be able to look at doing and, and as we talk with our tech departments and, and still practicing social distancing, but to be able to provide opportunities for our students to be able to engage. Now in Mobile County, it is extremely large, the largest one in the state. And as it's so large, there, there may be pockets in different areas, but how could you access all those students? With our current infrastructure, I don't think we could, but we can continue to try and to engage those students in a meaningful way. I think that's a key pieces of, one of the key pieces of building a community in a, in a global and an online world is make sure that we're trying consistently to meet the needs of the students that are, are, are out there, meet the needs of the community that are out there, to meet the needs of the parents and the faculty. Um, I want to tap back into and give a little bit of voice to what Dr. Moore was saying about how, to, what's the expectation for your parents and setting up for your teachers and setting up those routines. I think it's meaningful and important for us to be mindful that we are all dealing with the same issue. We're all self-quarantining. We're all finding ways to, to engage with the community in a meaningful way through digital, but to also practice social distancing. And that leveling of anxiety started by students uh, that our students are, expe are experiencing, our leadership teams are experiencing, our parents are experiencing, our, our community members are experiencing. I mean, the library right now is closed. Um, and so there are parents that are out there who are working in these places that we consider to be uh, essential places that don't get a chance to go home and, and engage with their students. So they're just as anxious as we are. And our teachers are just as anxious as everybody else is. So I got a word from one of my colleagues in, in New York today um, as encouragement to me, because we talk about how do we engage each other on a regular basis and check in with our folks that are around. Um, that's a key point, check in with the people that are around you and the people that you don't get to see, check in with them. Um, but encouraging that Ventura 100% of the time, we've given 100% all the time, but if we're giving 100% now, we're not doing justice to ourselves and being authentic with our, our own health. So we have to really look at what, what was 100% of my energy look like in this current setting and how can that be evaluated differently? So I may not require the teachers to be on the entire portion of the day, but they can engage, as Dr. Lombard just said, engage here a little bit there, as Dr. Stokely said, engage here a little bit there, do an out dial, do a call here or there, but they're not on the entire time. So they have time to take care of their children. Um, so that they have time to take care of their ailing adult, uh, adult family members. So they have time to take care of making sure food's on the table in a meaningful manner, especially knowing that we're not able to get all the things we can get from the grocery store in the time that we usually get things from the grocery store. So making sure that we're being mindful and communicating um, to the practical, I see that part, Dr. Moore, practical and realistic pieces of it, that we are human and we need to be able to do so. 
education is important, but again, as we talk about Maslow's needs, if we're not able to meet that piece of that basic portion of where we are, the standard of what safety looks like, then there's no need to even engage in that in educational opportunity. Um, and we can try, but it's, it's, it's really falling on deaf ears. It's falling on hungry bellies and anxious attitudes. So think about that as we're looking at what we're scheduling and how we're engaging with our folks. So there is a thing that's too much. There's a thing that's too little. We have to be the ones as leaders to find out what that balance is between. And part of that goes to our, our next slide where we talk about how do we ask for help. And I think this is a process um, of asking for that help. You know, what can we do? Who can we call to help? And so we can still use our chat room here. Uh, we can still use um, the other areas of, of speaking out here of how do we access and how do we get help there? How do we get the help that we need? Who do we need to ask? So think about that. Do we need to ask the technology director for how do we access these specific things? Do we have the bandwidth to even push this type of video out on a regular basis and that kind of thing? So the floor is open again for questions here. We had someone on the chat window say, as a parent and teacher, I feel like it will be challenging <clears throat> to juggle their schoolwork and my job responsibilities when and if we stay out for the rest of the year. As a parent myself, I can relate to that, that um, thought as well. I can relate to that as well. I ditched my kids. I'm sorry. I left my kids at home this morning to come to the site to be able to have this, this presentation. And it's hard to, but I also realize that I have to be able to find a way to do so. I find myself working at night, but also I wanted to work throughout the weekend thinking, oh, I've got, I've got to be able to get this thing done. But I had to realize we have to be mindful of our own personal health. And if we're not able to do some of these things, and that comes in, in from the role from, from leadership of realizing that, as we said a moment ago, we have to be able to figure out how we're going to engage our folks, still get them the resources they need, engage the students, but still allow them the opportunity to be, be at home and to be parents, because we do have to wear all the roles where we're able to say, I cannot be parent for a few moments while I'm in the classroom of my own children. Now I have to be parents for my own children, parents for the students in the class, parents for my elderly parents, because they want to get out of the house and do things and kind of parent them as well. But also all those things all, all come into, into, into play at one time. And so it becomes a meaningful action of um, the ability to say, I like this idea, but I'm not able to do this at this time. And for us as leaders to be able to say, you know what, I hear you. Let's talk about what we can do, what we can do in that negotiation between um, what do we do? And I think that's a part of how do we ask help? What is the help? I, I'm overwhelmed with this piece and being honest and having the opportunity to be, able to be overwhelmed because most of us are. And some of us are dealing with it in different ways. I see at Chickasaw in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the chat room, at Chickasaw we're calling every family this week and next week to find out what kind of technology they have and access to, have access to at this time. And I believe they're gonna to try to, she says, to provide one device for each family. And that's, that's, that's one way of progress, of progressing through providing access to students who don't have that access. Okay. Um, the next slide we talk about is called being, being intentional. And I think we've talked and interwoven the idea of being intentional throughout the entire presentation and the entire conversation today. Um, but providing equity, and I think that piece from Chickasaw there is providing equity for students to engage in online activities. What can we do to do that? So how do we engage those students in, in, in that we're not reaching at this point? And I think we've already started to hear some of those pieces just by having the conversation. Um, I see a note from the chat room. It says, my homeschool mother told me to stop trying to follow the traditional day. Find your child's true learning time. You will double your performance. I'll applaud that thought. Um, I have a, have a couple friends in, in, um, in the Houston area and um, they said, you know, what? we're gonna scrap the whole idea of doing school at eight o'clock in the morning, we're going to homeschool. And in the homeschool, excuse me, night school. So instead of starting at eight o'clock in the morning, they're starting at 10, 12, uh, one o'clock in the afternoon and they go until nine or 10 o'clock at night when the kids are up, they are refreshed, they're doing their other things. And instead of doing everything at one time, um, because we have to do those things to keep everybody in structure at the regular school day, in the digital world, we can do the time where we may do reading for a period of time in the morning when the kids are fresh. We may do math when the child is most fresh at math. It may be that one child, for me, I have three kids. 
one may be doing math at this part of the day, the other may be doing math at a different part of the day, because I can't teach all of them math or work with all three of them on math at the same time. Um, my wife and I can tag team, but both of us also have jobs. And so if I'm, if I'm in a meeting now, she may be working on math with one of the students at home. Um, so we can juggle those responsibilities and change the day up so it works in the ebb and flow. One of the key things that we don't talk about is how do we give our kids PE? Because they still need to be mindful of their physical health. Uh, what are they eating? Are we giving them opportunities to go outside? Are we, are we telling them that it's okay to go outside, to go out and, and play, maybe not with the neighbor's kids, but playing with those who are in your own house? or at least doing some you know, jump rope or shooting a basketball or, or doing something where they're doing something to keep their bodies active in a safe environment while they're social distancing. Um, Anne says again here, I think it's important to strike a balance. We all do better with schedules and structure, but let it be the one that fits your lifestyle and ability. And I think that's a very powerful voice that you're giving there, Anne, to say that play and be mindful of your students. We don't know them because we don't know their routines at home in that area but we can engage and let our parents know that they can engage their students and they don't have to have, they have a rigid schedule for those who are working beneficial for them. But as we talk about meeting the needs of all of our students, that rigid schedule may not be the most beneficial for every student and allowing them the flexibility to, to, to make a decision differently. Mm -hmm.